Hello and welcome to uh, Pixel Fizz. Sorry this one took so long to make. I got super busy working on another project, Warboard Tactics, which you can see in the background. Quick plug, this is uh, our indie game, uh, just me and a friend, and it essentially plays like Advanced Wars or Wargroove, if you've ever heard of those, uh, mixed in with some Age of Empire kind of mechanics. So you can build and you can develop your economy and purchase units to fight other people. Um, it's pretty much the gist of it. I'll have more on it later. It needs a lot of work still, but uh, today's lesson is moving beans, so we'll get back to that. Okay, so I'm picking this project up pretty much right where I left off on the networking solution. The big difference is I just have no UI. I got rid of it, um, and I'm just injected right into my game. That's that's how I want this one to work. So you can either do the same or you know have some other version of it. So here in my game manager, I am just in the start starting a host for four players. So another thing too, I don't think I added this in the last one, but in the game network manager, when you're joining a quest, just call a disconnect if uh, it's already active. This way you close out your network and then connect to anyone. A uh, good starting point here is to go ahead and create a bean for a player. This is just using a character controller and then I have a player controller script which runs this as well as a networking which I'll get into later. Also make sure on your player object that you do have a network object. This is the only one we're not doing a network transform. We'll handle that in the player controller. And then make sure in your network manager that you have the prefab listed in your player prefabs so it instantiates it automatically as well as in your network prefabs. So the whole foundation of this is going to be run from the server and the client running ticks. And they have to run at the same time. They have to be at the same step. And this is why we must use fix.deltaTime. If you use time.deltaTime, you will run into a lot of issues, and I'll explain that in a minute. So now I've got the server and the client tick step represented. This is the fixed update loop for the client and the server. And this spacing here for our fixed update is going to be... 0.2 seconds and that should be unity's default this is why we used fixed update so that each of these steps line up with each other even if one was like offset a little bit we're still in really good shape so now i've represented the time dot delta time this is the frame rate that each machine is getting you can see our server is running much faster than our client is this might be a little dramatic but it's just easier to show you in this fashion so I know a lot of you might be used to using time.deltaTime for like physics movements. When we move something, we times it by time.deltaTime, which is fine in single player. This is the gap between each frame. So that way it makes it more consistent, right? But when you're doing it on two different machines and trying to get the same movement, you end up with these huge gaps on one machine. Again, it's a little bit more dramatic in this example, but the client in this version of our networking is calling its own server RPC to moving. So the client is telling the server that, hey, I've moved, and then the server is gonna respond back. The problem is the server doesn't know what time step the client is on. So the server is gonna try to move that player with this kind of time step, where the client is actually moving with this time step. So you end up with the server moving the player maybe you know, this amount, whereas the client is moving the correct amount, and then the host on its player is going to be moving even faster. So by keeping everything in our fixed loop, we are always in sync. We, are, we don't have to worry about frame rate dependency because we do not want that in a multiplayer game. Another thing to note is that time about delta time is the average of frames in one second. And by average, I mean it, it counts or gives you the time period between the frames, but it does not add up to a perfect second. And that's why it is just kind of inherently the wrong, wrong system to use. So here in my movement controller, uh, I have a gravity and then I have just the regular move. And again, all of this is times by fixed dot delta time. So this is being called once per fixed update. But then I also have a times fixed dot delta time in there as well. If you want to change the tick rate for your game, uh, this will allow you to do that without seeing different movement speeds. Another thing to keep in mind too, if you are having issues with the physics simulation, there is a way in physics to just go ahead and turn off auto simulate. 
and then you can call physics.simulate in your code when you need to. Now I'm going to get into the main concept, which you'll see in a lot of text, a lot of code, a lot of documents referring to client prediction and server reconciliation. We need this buffer, right? So it's the idea of this rotating buffer where we can save our states, our inputs, our transforms with a tick as our index and keep track of our previous or our past selves. So if we imagine time going this way and our tick rates lining up the same, our client is sending an input through the network and the server is seeing it here and then coming back with the next position maybe to here, right? So in between these amount of frames, as we send, 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 right? We're still getting back a delayed response from the server. So that's why we keep track of our past selves. If this comes back to here, we can reference it to our position here and check to see if it's okay. And if it's not, we can then make the corrections to do so. So the server keeps track of where we're supposed to be. The client does its best and should be running the same physics to predict where the server is gonna put us. Back in the player controller, the first array is of input payload, which I have put in my game manager, just up at the top, I made a class, keeps track of the tick, the mouse movement, and whatever keys I'm pressing for the movement. So this next one, state payload, I've put in a separate script, and this one is iNetwork serializable, and this way we can send it over the network as itself, and the program knows how to read and write the tick position rotation and velocity and it's just a easier way of handling that so under our arrays we've set up the state payload we've set up one as a network variable as server state payload and this is the variable that it's going to be a constant on the server and then we'll be able to read from it when the server changes it this is what we're communicating as and directly under that, on enable, we're going to go ahead and make a callback for whenever this server state payload changes. And in our callback, I'm just changing a target state to the new value returned. And the target state is just a state payload variable that we have within the player controller. Now we can review the fixed update. So for the local player, uh, we're going to go ahead and process the movement with our player inputs. So the player inputs is a running variable that changes in our update step right here. And it keeps track of what we have pressed or what keys have been pressed that frame and then processes the movement based on what it is at at that current step. Here's my player inputs function. It's just getting the mouse X, the mouse Y, or vertical, or horizontal, yada, 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 and then just updating our player inputs based on the values. So that's pretty simple, pretty mundane. Next, we have the process local player movement, which I just realized I spelled wrong. We are getting our buffer index, which is based on our tick. And then if we are the client, we are telling the server through this server RPC what it is that our inputs are. So we are moving based on our inputs, but we're also telling the server to do it. So in this server RPC, we're taking in the movements that the player gave us, since we're now the server, right? Or the host, and we're calling the same functions. And then it's changing the server state based on our new position. So the second this gets changed, on our machine, the client, it immediately calls a state change, which changes our target state. So it's this constant send and, and receive feedback, and it kind of does, it, it's a little hard to wrap your head around since it's kind of doing both at the same time. So both the client and the server are running this script in parallel, but only accessing certain codes depending on which one it is or which host or client it is. So here, if we are the host, we don't need to tell ourselves that we're moving, right? So we're just gonna immediately process this. Then we're going to save the states that's in our buffer, and then we're gonna change our own server state payload. This save state function, uh, it just takes in the input, and then it takes in our transform, and then adds it to the buffer with the index that we're getting 
based on our tick. So back in our fix update, if we go down the line a little bit, if we are not the local player, our target state is gonna equal the server payload. And this is so if you're the client, the other players that you do not control actually get moved. So this is where their movement comes in. And if we do not equal the target state, then we're gonna reconcile our own. This is just a way for us to basically see if we're not the local player, we don't have to worry about it because we're only trying to fix ourselves in our own script. So we're getting the tick value of what we got passed in. We're identifying if we are out of sync with the server. I've just put a 0.5 tolerance. You can do whatever you want. If we are out of tolerance, uh, we're going to turn the player controller off. This just, for some reason, it has to work like this. You then fix your transform based on the new server position. And then we have to, for each frame that's passed since the server has seen us, we need to replay all of our inputs. So if five frames have passed since the server thinks that we have moved, we need to replay all five frames with the same inputs over again to put us in our current state. And this is what we're doing. We're replaying them. We're finding out what, what they were, updating them, and then moving ourselves, and then also saving it, and we're basically overriding the positions that we had previously to try and correct the stuff that we've done in the future from when the server has, has seen it. So in this scene, I'm running as the client, and you can see my bean is blue, and then my server over here, who's running his own bean, you'll see it as green. And we can move around, and I can look around, and we can move around together. Now, in this version, I am the host, and I am red in this representation, and my client is flashing blue and green. Um, the client would see me as green, like we did in the last one. Now, the reason why I have different colors, uh, I have a function here that changes the materials. I'm trying to find each one. so. Here, when it's not the owner and it's just changing based on the target position, it's going to change its color to yellow. If we go down to the process movement, if I am not the server, I'm going to be uh, blue. If I am the server, I'm going to be red. And then if I am the server and I'm changing a client, it's going to be green. Yeah, okay, I think this is a better way of doing it. So if I'm not the server or the host, I'm also not the owner of that script, then we're gonna only move that player based on its transform, right? So this makes it so if you're the host, you would see everybody else as yellow in this script. If you are a client, everybody else would be green because, because green is three or the my third material in this array, fourth, that would be that change. So because only the host is getting its movement through the server RPC. That's why we saw that flickering earlier, because it was doing both, the host was doing both this movement and the other movement, but we can separate that. So this is just better code, I guess. This is lazy, but figure it out later. So in an effort to visualize this, I have the two machines, right? So we've got the host and the client on their separate things. So both player scripts on either machine are being run parallel but independent from each other, right? So the host owns this one and its movement is in red. The client owns this one and its movement is in blue. So the client is doing a physics move on its own telling the host through that server RPC that this script is trying to move. And then this script moves through a physics move. And then it relays that information back to the owned client through our server state input, or our server state, which is that class that we made to handle all the transform and the rotation and the velocity. And then if it screws up, we're moving through a transform move through the reconciliation step. This is why it's a little hard to like wrap your head around. Whereas the host, it's doing physics steps for all of these, right? The host 
is just sending the transform data directly to this other script that we're running and then that's going straight into a transform move now that's essentially the gist of the whole thing um, you can pause and review the code that I've written. I'm not going to put it up on GitHub because this isn't something that you can just copy paste into your own project. Again, a lot of the techniques are pretty much the same. It's just how you implement it is going to need to be unique depending on what you're trying to do. So one issue that I have in this, if you, if you do just copy paste, you'll see that the movement for the client, this is the host. So the movement for the client is like really jittery, right? Uh, this is something I just haven't fixed. It's due to my camera being locked to the bean. So as the bean moves, the camera is being updated on the fixed step. I'm going to get rid of that and end up just having the camera on a different script to follow the bean instead of updating on the fixed step. So that should get rid of this jittery. Again, I haven't done it. You can see sometimes it like locks on and gets on step. Guess, guess it doesn't want to do that. But anyway, it's terrible. And I highly recommend you either find your own solution for it or just do what I just said. But anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you at least learned something. Uh, maybe if it's not the best tutorial I've ever done or that's out there. It is good enough to get you started. And then from here, you can work on some of the more complicated techniques. And in the future, I might do some videos on some of those techniques as well. Anyway, thank you. Have a good one.